Um, so tonight, it's my privilege, opportunity here on uh, this cold February night here on Sunday, this Valentine's Day, uh, to present you with a gospel message tonight, a message of good news, definitely good news tonight. Uh, there's, there's no uh, hesitancy on my part to tell you that the news that we have for you this evening is the best of all news coming from the most reliable of all sources. And so if you have a Bible tonight, I want to read a verse it's found in the New Testament, and it's found in the book of 2 Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians 5, and verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. Um, you've read through some of the New Testament. I would say a lot of casual Bible readers probably have read this verse, maybe heard it. And so I want to read this first, and I just want to go through it tonight, take you through it, uh, maybe not word by word, but definitely look at it. But I want to look at it um, in a way that really asks the difficult questions that seem to be asked to, um, maybe sometimes asked to people who, who have a faith in Jesus Christ, or, or people who are searching. I, I think questions are, are the foundation of any good inquiry into these things. You never, blind faith is never spoken of in the Bible. And so um, I'm going to be posing the questions tonight. That might sound unfair, and hopefully uh, I do it in a very faithful way. But we're going to read this first, and then we're going to look at it in that way by asking some of the difficult questions. Hopefully, some of these answers that we can see will be found in this verse. So if you found it by now, I wish I could tell you what page it's on, but I can't because we all have different page numbers. But if you don't have a Bible, you can just uh, listen with a keen ear here to the words of the Apostle Paul as he pens them here years and years ago, but they're still as pertinent, as important as they ever were today. The words of 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, and it says this, for our sake, for our sake, he made him to be sin. We're going to go over those pronouns. You might be wondering, who's he talking about? We're going to go over those. For our sake, he, that is God, made him, that is Jesus Christ, to be sin. Then it's going to give us a little characteristic about Jesus Christ, who knew no sin. He didn't know sin. There was nothing about him that was sinful. Who knew no sin, that in him, that's in Jesus Christ, we might become something we never were before. So this is something we were not born, something that we could not acquire on our own, but that this is something that God makes us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I'm going to read that verse one more time without my words. I'm just going to read it straight through the way you would read it here in the pages of the Holy Bible. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God, that we might become the righteousness of God. I find it tremendous that that tucked away uh, in this letter here uh, at the back part of uh, a tremendous volume of letters. At the back end here, we, we have on the third page of this letter written from a missionary to a very struggling church. We have these fantastic words um, that that are words that are so powerful that tell us so much about the problem and the solution that is found in the pages of this Bible. Um, I often refer to the back end of the Bible. When I was in uh, school, um, it wasn't until university that they gave you books where the answers were in the back. And when you found out the answers were in the back, it was fantastic. You'd go flip right back to the last page, and usually it was the odd numbers that gave you the answers. And uh, the difficulty was is that it gave you the answer, but it didn't tell you how to solve the problem. You just got the final result. And I say, yeah, the answers are in the back of this Bible. But my friend tonight, if you could also understand not just the answer as it's written down on the page, but the way in which God was able to provide that answer, which is his son, Jesus Christ, what a difference it would make in your life. In this same chapter, it tells us that God makes people new. He makes individuals who are sinful, new creations. He has that power to do that. 
and it's because of what Jesus Christ did. And so I, I find it, even though tucked away here on the fourth or fifth page of a, of a letter that maybe few people have ever heard of, these great words, and I think it's great to be able to come here tonight and to read them because this statement expresses the heart of the gospel message, the very heart of the gospel message of a God who loves you tonight and a God who gave something. He demonstrated that love. Not only that, but I, I think if we were all maybe honest, and uh, I think none of us maybe are trained sociologists, or we all just kind of read the newspaper, we take a look around, uh, it seems to be that the trend right now is that more and more people are living as though this is all that we got. This is it. When when this life is done, it, the, 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 book, the book is done. It, uh, when this life is over, that's it. Make the most of it. Um, I, I think the, 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 the terms and the statements and, the, and even the uh, quotations uh, abound as to do what you can now because you don't get a second chance. So make the most of life, the, the carpe diem idea that this is it. And if people buy into that, they never buy into the gospel because this is not it. Eternity. Eternity is a mighty long time. Eternity is what follows life. And so if this is not it, but if in this life what you do determines where you will be in the next, you don't want to get that wrong. That's not something that you want to, to, to get wrong. And so I'm here to tell you on, on the basis of the Bible, not my own thoughts, that this is not it. That this is not, this is not when you die, it's not over. There's something after that. And, and when we think of that, uh, the, the Bible tells us that, that what is to come, it, it really can't explain it in time sense. And so it says one day in, in eternity, it's like a thousand years. And that can be scary if you're unsure about your future. But it can be tremendous if you know the answer to the difficult questions that life has posed for every one of us. And not just an answer, but a person, Jesus Christ. And so when you think of eternity, when you think of where you're going to be, when you, when you even think of this life, what, what makes the difference in this life? I, I often ask people where they're going to be, where, where they're going to be uh, when, it, when it's all said and done. And, and often people come back and they, they want to know where, you know, well, I've, I've sent my resume in or people want to know what are the qualifications to get into this paradise, into this heaven? What are the qualifications to get in? What are, what are the requirements? What is the purchase price? Just give me the answer. Tell me about that. Um, I'm so fascinated these days by who qualifies for what. Now, the other day, uh, I went online, tried to qualify for a vaccine. That may uh, be some other people's also idea here. To get online and find out if you qualify based on age or based on illness, based on profession. And, and it seems that there's very few things, you know, that you could say, oh, I wish I qualified for that. I wish I could make it into that category. And maybe you've wondered that about heaven. And I'd love tonight through the word of God, maybe to show you through this verse that we've read, that you are guaranteed to qualify for heaven. And that qualification is not based in something that you do, but in something that was done for you. So let's look at this verse and let's look at it in light of some of the difficult questions that sometimes are posed to us when it comes to concerning the gospel. First of all, I was thinking, whenever you ask someone about their idea of, 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 of the solution, uh, or the answer, or, or the way to heaven, the, the, the way to this forgiveness, or to this giant pardon. I don't want to be condemned. I don't want to be judged. The way to it, a lot of times you, you want to know who has designed your belief system, or, or that plan, that plan that, that you subscribe to, that message that you speak. Who came up with that? Who designed that? Who's the originator? Was it was it a person who, who took off into some distant land and, and gained some teaching and came back and wrote some books? Was it a scholar? Was it a, an archaeologist? Was it a scientist? Who came up with your belief system? I love how the verse tells us that it was for our sake, he. He. You say, who's the he? Who's the he in this verse? Well, you only have to go to the end of the last verse. 
And it tells you right away, it was God. This is God's plan. This is not my plan. But this is God's plan. That's a wonderful truth. Uh, you wrap your head around that, and it makes for such ease that this is not a plan that was devised by human intuition. It was not a plan that was somehow voted on by the House of Representatives. It was not come up with in a, by a board of trustees. This was not something that was formulated by the greatest minds of this world. But this is God's plan. God's plan, the same God that planned. I have a friend who's visiting the Rocky Mountains this weekend, and he showed me a picture of it. The same God who has planned the landscape, the same God who has planned the ocean bottom floors, the same God who has planned the wonders of this world, the same God who has planned the intricate design of the human body, the same God who has planned the, the different animal uh, kingdoms that we look at and the different ways in which we look at nature, the same God who has planned all that, he planned this salvation because he planned Calvary. Sometimes we look at the crucifixion and we think of the depravity of a world. We think of the, 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 the low point of humanity. And that is true, but don't over forget that Calvary was planned by God. It's his plan to bring you back to save your soul. That's why our verse here that we read here in 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 says, for our sake, he, he, this same God who planned out the six days of creation also planned out the six hours of Calvary. This same God, this same father who sent his son to be the savior of the world. He's the architect. He's the designer. It's his purpose plan, he was involved in every detail. And that might alarm you, but actually it gives me such security because no detail in my salvation was left to me, nor was it left to someone who had the same problem that I had. But the plan of salvation was left to the one who is eternal, the one who is the creator. It's his plan. He made him. Those are tremendous thoughts. Maybe you've never thought of it like that before, but it should be reassuring that the salvation story, unlike so many of the other solutions that this world has put forth, is faultless. It has no expiration, and it is without any error because it wasn't planned by man. It was planned by God. God, you know, sometimes the next question that I might ask people when they tell me about their plan for eternity or they tell me about their solution is, I say, in what kind of environment, what kind of context did this plan ever originate? What, what, what caused it? What, how did it formulate? What, what drove you to the drawing table or, or what made you say, we got to come up with a, an answer here? And when I think of the context of this verse, because a lot of times, to be honest, Christians are always said that we just take verses and we rip them. We rip them right out of the Bible. We, we reach in kind of like those video games with the claws where it goes down and it just picks something right out of a, a herd of stuffed animals. Uh, sometimes we just say, we'll just pick a verse out and we'll, we'll use it. And we could just care less about whatever the context around that verse says. Uh, what does it matter? It's the same way people do that with speeches or politics is crazy about that. Just to pick something out and to use it for our good and, and to use it. And a lot of people say that's putting spin on things. And to say, ah, the context doesn't matter. But the context in this verse tells us everything that we could want to know. A context that over and over and over and over again. If you read 2 Corinthians 5, the context mentions this one word over and over and over again. This one word. The word reconciliation. Reconcile. You probably have heard the word. Sometimes uh, people who are fighting, you could have managers in the office. They say, oh, we, they need to be reconciled. A lot of times it's used in marriages. Uh, but spouses aren't getting along. If there's been some type of a fight, some type of a difficulty, they need to be reconciled. Uh, I think it was even mentioned last week in the Super Bowl of teammates that, that for a while were at odds and they needed to be reconciled in order to to play together on the same field. 
And so reconciliation is this great truth in the life of, of being at odds and, and having to be brought together. And when you read in this chapter, it tells us about a God who wanted to reconcile, it talks us about a message of reconciliation. And over and over again, you can't take this, that the context in this chapter, the environment that has caused this verse to find its place is this truth of reconciliation. A lot of times we use that, that, that thought and you say, who needs to be reconciled to who? What's, what's the difficulty? Where is the problem? Where is the problem in all this? You, a lot of times we, we search, you know, uh, they don't tell you sometimes what the problem is in a, in a, in a mystery novel until you're well into the book or, or you have to wait until you really scoured through documents to find the problem that is hindering a company from being profitable. But it's only on page two or three of the Bible that we find out the problem. And the problem was us. The problem was sin. And the problem was giant. You know, that's the problem in all of the difficulties of this life. A lot of times people really aren't too concerned about what your solution is. They want to know what you think the problem is. What do you think the problem is? And a lot of people will tell you the problem is, is society. The problem is, is a social issue. No, some people say, no, the problem is an economic problem. There's, there's, there's no way we can survive going down this current economic route. And others might say, no, the, pro the problem is definitely a climate issue. That's the problem. How can we expect our future generations to live on this earth in hundreds of years if we continue the way we are? And the problem, no matter where you go, it doesn't matter if you look at the current numbers of what the virus has done. I think today I took a look and oh, over 2.5 million deaths. In the U.S., we're approaching half a million. It doesn't matter if you look at that. It doesn't matter if you go to some places where uh, economic depravity would make you sad. Uh, the, the ways in which families have been ripped apart, hospitals are filled, the ways in which uh, separation, neglect, abuse, all these things, uh, at the root of every one of them is sin. You can't deny that. I don't think, although I have heard differently, I don't think there's any one of us that doesn't deny there's a problem. A lot of us are just wondering what the solution is. The problem is sin. The problem is within me. I'm willing to admit that. I'm willing to admit that early on. Who is not willing to admit that the problem resides within my human heart? Many have said that the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. But what is the solution? So here, it's reconciliation. Getting me back to God. Somehow, bridging this gap. You know, my sins can't be reconciled to God. I. Those, those can't be brought back to him, but me, a sinner, I can be reconciled to God. If only I could have these sins forgiven, if I could have them taken away, if I could have them removed, if I could have them done away with. But how? And how in a just way could I ever be brought back to God and have my sins taken care of? How is that possible? And here, in these words that we have read, is the answer of how man and God, this great gap that has existed. I, I think a lot of times we look at God like an absentee landlord. He, 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 he built the place, he occupied it, and he left, and somehow he's going to come back at, a, at an unknown date in the future. But that's not so. The, the, the truth is that we left him. How many of us have acknowledged him, even in a given day like today? How many of us acknowledge when the sun rises again in the east and it sets in the west? How many of us have acknowledged again the, the, the breath that we just took in? So many of the wonderful things that we've been blessed with today, and yet he's the one. He's the architect of it all, and he goes unacknowledged, and yet he is the one that we've distanced ourselves from, and he's the one who's looking for us. He's the one who's seeking, and he's the one who wants to save reconciliation, the context of the problem, and why we have these words written down here of a God who for our sakes made his son sin, who didn't know any sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So we've looked at the originator. We've looked at the context of the problem. Next, I just want to look at this. Whenever you see a solution that is offered for anything, there's always one glaring I would say difference 
You know, a lot of things can have the same opening, the same conclusion. A lot of things can have similar details. But if it's truly, if it's truly something that is going to offer a unique solution to a giant issue or problem, you say there's going to be something about it that's going to be glaringly different from the rest. And I feel that a lot of issues that we face, you know, a lot of people offer the same uh, the same solutions. Time heals all wounds. That's usually the solution for most things. Just sweep it under the carpet. Forget about it. A lot of religions offer the same solution to the difficulties that we have, and that's just do your best. Uh, a lot of, um, you know, you would say self-help teachers, gurus, life coaches, a, a lot of the secrets to the success of, of just being a better person all kind of boiled down to what's your effort look like? What's your work ethic going to be? Are you willing to get up a little earlier, put a little more effort in? That seems to be the solution. But but uniquely in the Bible and uniquely in Christianity, the solution is not a what and it's not a me. The solution is a person and the solution is a man, Jesus Christ. And here, the emphasis, the unique emphasis is not on me in this verse. It's on him. And what it says about him can be said of no other human being. If there are 7 billion, 100 million, uh, 321,638 individuals on earth right now, it can be said of not one of them. And it could never be said of any human being who's ever been on earth, except for one. And this is what it says. He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. People always ask me why they can't save themselves, why they can't get their own way to heaven, why they can't achieve, why they can't earn. And I, I don't say it. The Bible says it over and over again for one reason and one reason only, because we all have the same problem. We all have sin inside our hearts. And so the solution must lie in one man who didn't have the problem we did. And that one man was Jesus Christ. You know, it's only him. You want to read in your Bibles later on, that sinless man. That's so unique to Christianity, so unique to the Bible, that the solution is presented in a man who was sinless. Who didn't have the problems that we had. Didn't have the difficulty that we have come under because of the way we were born, born into sin. And how significant that this is it. There was a man that was presented, Jesus Christ. You say, he had the same 46 chromosomes we all have. He had the same heart that beat 100,000 times in a day, just like ours. He had the same five senses. He had the same type of eyes. He probably looked nothing like the pictures that we see on the museum walls. But he most likely had dark hair, probably had dark eyes. You say, he, he wouldn't have stood out if you looked at him compared to the rest of humanity that lived in the Galilean area of the land of Israel. But this was different about him than any other human being. There was no sin in him. Nothing. He couldn't sin. He couldn't think of sin. He had no sin in him. You know, so significant when you read in John 8, he stood up at a festival that was tremendous, packed. And he stood up at that festival and he said, which one of you can tell me of a sin that I've done? None of us would ever attempt that. And yet here was the man, Christ Jesus. He stood up in front of all those individuals that day and said, tell me something I've done wrong. Tell me something I've done wrong. Not only that, the man who judged him at the crucifixion, Pilate, over three times. I don't think I've ever heard of any other judge before then, after then, or will ever say this of any individual, no matter how innocent they appear to be. This judge said about Jesus Christ, I find no guilt in this man. I find no guilt in this man. It was the thief who hung on the cross next to him. The thief, the, the, the robber, as the Bible says, who hung on the cross next to him, who said, this man, he's done nothing wrong. Actually, in the original language, it's stronger than that. It says he's done nothing out of place. He's done nothing wrong. It was the Roman centurion who officiated the crucifixion that day, when the Lord Jesus died, he said, truly, this was an innocent man. Truly, this was an innocent man. It was the man, John, one of his closest friends, disciples, 
after being with him well over a thousand days, almost in continuity over those years that he ministered. This was the man, John, one of his closest uh, confidants who could say about him, in him was no sin. How significant. How significant then that the one that we declare, Jesus Christ, was sinless, didn't have the issue that's plaguing each one of us, that's plaguing our societies, plaguing our families, that's plaguing this world. Here's the one who came. And as though you couldn't believe it, there are some things in the Bible I could believe if they were never there. There, there, there's, There's statements in the Bible, and if they weren't in the Bible, I'd still believe them. But this is one of those statements, if it weren't there, I can never believe it. It says that God made him to be sin. And he never knew sin. You say, what does that mean? What does that mean that God made him to be sin? Does it mean that he made him a sinner? No, God makes no one sinners. God doesn't make you a sinner. He doesn't make me a sinner. I I chose that. I chose that lifestyle. What does it mean that God made his son sin? Brings me to my next point. What is the unique part of Christianity that maybe a lot of people miss? That is so pertinent to this subject matter tonight of how you can be reconciled to God, how you can be forgiven. Here is the point that I don't want you to miss tonight. That salvation is an exchange. Salvation is substitution. Sometimes we use that word uh, vicarious. Do you ever go to a church and see that a vicar is speaking? He's a substitute. He's just doing something in place of someone else. Salvation was an exchange. It was a substitution. That when Christ Jesus was made sin for me, it was instead of me. You say, how, how am I expected to understand this? Well, the, the Bible on every other page is littered with this truth that God did something for us. And he did it because he offered his son. He gave a son. It's, it's the great apostle Peter who tells us in the third chapter of his book that the just one died for the unjust was an exchange that he might bring us to God. A lot of times when you look at exchanges, it's so common to look at both sides of the exchange because a a trade has value on both sides. There's, There's always a monetary element and maybe a product element. Or in the sports world, there's a a number of individuals for one superstar, but a a trade has has value on both sides, except for this trade, except for this exchange. There was someone Maybe like you or like me who could say, I was, I was a, a sinful human being. I was as though like everyone else in this world. I was one who was far from God. And yet God exchanged his lovely, sinless son for me. In fact, if you want to know what this says right here, I'll give it to you in very simple terms. Next time you look at Calvary, next time you look at the crucifix, And you think how gruesome and how violent and how detestable and how unjust and how disgusting sometimes Calvary or crucifixion looks. Be reminded of this, that that day at Calvary, God treated his son as though he were me. So that in turn, God can treat me as though I were his son. So what Paul is saying here, because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul can know forgiveness. Because God treated his son like he were me. And thank God, because we have an opportunity to believe that Christ died for our sins. Because we can believe that truth, because we can take it in and stake our lives on it, that God then treats me as though I were his son. You say, that's not what it, you go down to the end verse there. The last verse, 
the end of the verse says this, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When it's all said and done, when it's all said and done, this is what it comes to. Do you want to die with self-righteousness or God's righteousness? Self-righteousness, all the good works I've done, all the merit, all the achievement, all the earning and all the deserving. Would I prefer to die with my self-righteousness or would I prefer to die with God's righteousness? Because here the Apostle Paul tells me, you don't want the one. He's already told me in a book called Romans 3 that all my righteousness is like filthy rags. But here I'm offered the righteousness of God. If I were to believe that when God gave his son, when God made his son sin, he did that for me. That's how the verse starts, for my sake, because he loved me without a cause. I gave him no cause to love me, yet he gave his son. He offered his son, and God, the originator of this plan, made his son to be sin, a son who knew no sin, that I might be made the righteousness of God in him. You say, I don't know. That sounds something fantastic. It is fantastic. And not only that, it's written in this Bible. It's the only reason I believe it. Wouldn't have believed it if I heard it from human lips. But I believe it because it comes from God's word, a word that will never expire. It'll never go out of style. It'll maybe go out of style in society. But according to heaven, this is the eternal document that stands the test of time. And we find those words written in this Bible that God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You could believe that tonight. Believe that. And you could be saved because you would be a son of God. You would be forgiven of your sin. You would know the solution to being separated from God and being reconciled to him is all found in his son, Jesus Christ. What he did when he died for you. Not everyone believes it. Some people will look for another type of righteousness, maybe their own. But there are those who, upon hearing this good news, realize this is too good to pass up because this is God's plan. And I'm hoping to make it to God's heaven one day. We pray that you too tonight might trust the Savior, Jesus Christ, know your sins forgiven, and know this sinless Savior, the one who took your place and died for you.